Thankful for the encouragement and the edification of song, amen, and ministry of the Word of God through song. Well, it's good to see you this evening. I'm going to ask you to please join with me in turning to the book of 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. And we begin reading this evening at verse 7. We're going to read down to verse 11. 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning at verse 7. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keeping, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's go to our God together in prayer this evening. Lord, we thank you for this evening you give us to be together. And before we encounter your word, I pray that we would just be mindful of where we stand in light of eternity, that, Lord, we are literally one heartbeat away, one breath away from our everlasting destination. And, Lord, at any moment, the trump could sound and our Lord could return and our everlasting future would begin there, beyond this age that we're living in right now. I thank you that as we live here in this time, you give us everything we need for life and godliness in your Son, and that includes the means of grace that we're experiencing tonight, the gathering of the saints together, the opening of your word through song and then through proclamation, the experience that we have opportunity to engage in of exhorting each other, encouraging each other all the more as we see the day approaching. I pray in the midst of, of this spiritual battle that we find ourselves in, in the midst of so much that fights against our faith, you would increase our faith. And I pray, Lord, that you would always make us mindful that we are yours and who we are in the midst of, of this lost and dying world. And we thank you that even when we lose sight of these things and we find ourselves spiritually weary, even then, Lord, you are faithful and you hold on to us and you, you are the explanation for our perseverance. You are the explanation for our endurance. And so we ask that now you would meet with us around your word and instruct our minds and encourage our hearts, reprove us of our sins, show us the pathway you would have us to walk. And Lord, work in our hearts so that our motivations would be pure. And we will thank you for this. We also ask for anyone in our midst who doesn't know you tonight, that Lord, you would grant salvation. We long to see many saved in these days, and we ask you for this. And we ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight, I want you to think with me about the subject of stewardship Stewardship. When you think about stewardship, when you think about managing something, being faithful with something, executing some responsibility that you've been given or taking care of something that's been placed into your care. When you think about stewardship, what is it that comes to your mind? What are the categories that you normally think about when you think about the subject? I'm going to guess that most of us, top on the list, we would think about money. When you hear the word stewardship, you tend to think about finances. And so we think about being a good steward of the money the Lord has entrusted to us. 
Or maybe you think about your time, being a good steward of your time, making sure you manage that well. Or maybe you think about something like your health, especially if you have health concerns. You think about making sure that you do the things you need to do to be healthy and live as the Lord would have you to live, take care of your body. Maybe you think about your job. You think about the responsibilities you've been given there. Maybe you think about your family, the stewardship of your marriage, the stewardship of raising your children. Think about the various categories that you usually think about when you think about stewardship. Tonight, we're going to be looking at a particular area of stewardship that I believe is is perhaps among the most neglected in our thinking. We think about stewardship in a lot of different areas, but I would ask you, when is the last time you thought, thought about stewardship with respect to your spiritual gift? When is the last time you thought, thought about your spiritual gift when you thought about stewardship? That's the subject matter of these two verses that we're going to focus on tonight, verse 10 and 11. I read beginning at verse 7 to put these in their context, but notice again what he says in verse 10. As each has received a gift... Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To Him be long glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. He tells us in verse 10 that we are to be good stewards of God's varied grace. And when he talks about that varied grace, he's talking about spiritual gifts. That's what we're going to think about together this evening. We're going to look at this under three headings. We're going to talk about the reality of spiritual gifts. That is, we're just going to take note of some general truths revealed in these two verses about spiritual gifts. Then we're going to think about the responsibility of spiritual gifts. The fact that God has given us a spiritual gift results in a responsibility. And we're going to listen to the Spirit of God as He tells us what that responsibility is about in these two verses. And then we're going to think together about the reason for spiritual gifts. Why has Christ given gifts to His church? What is the reason for spiritual gifts? But we begin tonight with the reality of these gifts. We just need to stop and let it register with us that spiritual gifts are real. They are the result of Christ's saving work. He died for our sins. He was raised from the dead. He's ascended into the heavens. And as a result of his triumph, gifts have been given to his people. Spiritual gifts are ascension gifts. They come to us from Christ and imparted to us by the Spirit of God. What is a spiritual gift? It is a divinely imparted capacity, enablement for ministry to other people. It is God giving you an ability that was not yours before He saved you. We're not talking about natural gifts tonight talking about spiritual gifts. It is a God-given capacity for ministry and enablement for ministry that you received because the Lord saved you. You received it in union with Christ. You received it as a result of the indwelling Spirit's work in your life. It is a salvation gift, and it's given to you for the purpose of ministering to other people. These things are real, supernatural, spiritual, having to do with salvation, and absolutely real. Now, what do we learn about these gifts in these two verses? There are six things I want to point out. First of all, notice with me, they are expressions of God's grace. Spiritual gifts are grace gifts. In fact, when he says in verse 10, as each one has received a gift, the word for gift there is charisma. It it is a grace gift. That's what the word means, a free gift. And so the very word itself reminds us that these enablements for ministry, these capacities for ministry are the result of Christ's saving work. We never need to think about spiritual gifts without thinking about Jesus, thinking about salvation, thinking about God's grace. 
So these are grace gifts. He also emphasizes that at the end of verse 10, when he refers, in referring to spiritual gifts, he refers to them in terms of God's varied grace. God's grace is, we'll talk more about this in just a moment, but there's great variety in the grace of God, and these spiritual gifts give expression to that variety. So when he talks about God's varied graces in the context of spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 1 says this, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. And so right away he's telling the, the Corinthians, I want you to understand the nature, the character of how these gifts function. They, they function to exalt Christ, and to tell the truth about Him. They operate in the realm where Jesus is acknowledged to be Lord. Verse 4, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord, and there are varieties of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Do you know that? What, what is a spiritual gift? It is, it is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit's work. Verse 8, for to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as He wills. Spiritual gifts are sovereignly assigned. As I said earlier, Christ gives the gifts. They are distributed by means of the Spirit's work. Individually given as God so wills, as the Spirit wills. Verse 12, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. But the body does not consist of one member but many. The whole context for that conversation there about spiritual gifts is the context of salvation. It is union with Christ. It is the work of the Spirit. Baptized into the Spirit, that is, or into the body of Christ by means of the Spirit of God. So, so the fact that He indwells us speaks of our union with Jesus. These gifts are expressions of the grace of God. It is because you are saved that you have a spiritual gift, and if you are not saved, you don't have one. Secondly, I want you to notice about these gifts. We noted it there in 1 Corinthians 12. We see it in our text. Every one of us who is saved has a gift. Verse 10, notice what it says. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another, as each has received a gift. Every believer, each believer has a spiritual gift. 1 Corinthians 12, 6 said that everyone has one. Verse 6 says, um, and there are varieties of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them all in everyone. Verse 7 says, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So, there's no one who's a Christian who doesn't have this stewardship we're talking about tonight. If you're saved, you've been given a stewardship. You have a ministry stewardship. Every Christian has a capacity for ministry. It's so important to let really settle upon our hearts. You, you cannot claim that you cannot minister in this body because you're not qualified or because you're not equipped the Lord has equipped you. By saving you, He has equipped you. Obviously, with ministry and with teaching, your capacities for service increase and broaden and deepen. But the very fact that the Lord has saved you means He has imparted to you an ability for ministry, and now that imparts to you a stewardship. 
And I think too often the reason we may get confused about this is we have too narrow a definition for what ministry is. And so we think about formalized ministries. We think about, we think about programs. And maybe we don't quite see how we fit into this program or that program in the church or how we might serve in this ministry or that ministry of the church. Well, there's no doubt that you may find a place of ministry in one of the formalized areas of our church's life. You may find an area of, of service in one of the programs that, that, that we have, but most of the ministry we do is not formal in nature. It's supernaturally natural. In fact, I would encourage you to think about your spiritual giftedness this way, that to serve the Lord with the gift that He's given you, it means you're going to be actively you on behalf of others in the family of God, for the glory of God. So it's you. Now, now a saved individual, spirit indwelt, spirit-filled, serving the Lord Jesus Christ and being who you are in Christ, being who you are as a believer, empowered by the Spirit of God, actively ministering to other members of this body for their good and for the glory of God. That's your spiritual gift in use. You being actively you on behalf of others in the family of God for the glory of God. Maybe formal, maybe informal. But as you serve that way, you're being a good steward. As you serve that way, you're putting your gift to use. So each one of us has a gift. Third thing I would note about these gifts, they are multifaceted. He describes them in verse 10 as, as an expression of God's varied grace. And the word varied there is the word poikilos. Literally means many colored. Many colored. Be a good steward of God's uh, variegated grace, His grace that expresses great variety. You be a good steward of this. I actually think this helps us to understand spiritual gifts as well. Notice we each have a gift, singular, verse 10. Each one has received a gift, singular, but this gift is an expression of God's many-colored grace. I don't know if you've ever been in a church where they do like spiritual gift testing. <clears throat> Can I just say you don't, don't take that test. Uh, it really is just a personality test. It really won't tell you anything about your spiritual gift. You, you can't test for spiritual giftedness. The, the better way to think about it is this. If you think about a, a painter's palette with many colors on it, and you think about the, the spiritual gift categories that are listed in the New Testament, you read 1 Corinthians 12, you read Romans 12, you look at those spiritual gift categories. And you, if you were to think about a painter taking colors from the various areas of giftedness and mixing those together and imparting to you as an individual believer a unique capacity for ministry, that's the better picture. So that your gift is as unique as you are. There are no two people gifted in exactly the same way. And the God who created you is the God who saved you and the God who has gifted you for ministry. So it should not be surprising to us if our spiritual gift happens to also work well with our natural gifts. And so you're, you're like, as I've heard it described by someone else, you're like a spiritual snowflake, as it were. You, you are unique in terms of your ability to serve Christ in the life of his people. And so you're to be a good steward of this, of this gift that is many-colored. It is multifaceted. What that means is instead of asking, what is my gift? And there are so many people who spend so much time wondering about that. What is my gift? What is my gift? Just take this challenge. Search the New Testament where we're told how to discover what our gift is. I mean, find that. Or find people asking what their individual gift is. That kind of, of thought process is foreign to the New Testament. No, here's the idea. You be submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, and you be busy in ministry where you have desire, where the Lord opens doors of opportunity, and where you see Him blessing you. 
And then as, as you take note of that, you'll begin to discover what the Lord has made you to do. And you may even discover that he uses you in different ways in different seasons of your life. That at one particular point in your life, you were useful in this particular area, but then as you grow and mature, or, or maybe circumstances change, or, or the settings change, then you find out he uses you in another way. We need to get rid of these categories that sometimes are, are just human constructions. We just need to, to look at this subject from the, the, the vantage point of God's Word, and you find out that here's what it is. We've been saved. God has given each one of us a gift, and that gift is going to be multifaceted. That's why you can have two men gifted to teach, and yet they're very different. The Lord uses each one in powerful ways and unique ways, but they're different. Fourth thing I would point out here, basic, it's clear, but it's important. Notice that these gifts are given for service to people. Verse 10, as each one has received, or each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. That's what you do with it. You serve one another. You serve people. Or as 1 Corinthians 12, 7 told us, they've been given for the common good. For the common good. What does that mean? It means that spiritual gifts are not given for your personal edification. Spiritual gifts are not given for private use. Now, that does not mean, I want to be careful, that does not mean that you do not experience personal edification as you use your giftedness. Serve the Lord, serve others, and you'll see the benefits in your own life. Serve the Lord, serve others, you'll see spiritual growth, spiritual joy, spiritual satisfaction. So, so I'm not saying you don't experience personal edification as you use these gifts. What I am saying is they are not for use in some isolated setting. When you hear someone try to define the gift of languages, for example, the gift of tongues as a private prayer language, that is foreign to the whole purpose for spiritual gifts. They weren't given for you to use with respect to yourself. They are given for you to use in service to other people for the common good. Romans 12.3 says, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Having gifts then, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, same kind of language, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness, all that, as you can see, has to do with serving others. But what you also recognize then, even in that Romans passage, is because this is a gift of grace and because it's been given for service to others, there is no room for personal pride. Not only is it not for private use, it is never a grounds for personal exaltation. There is no reason in spiritual giftedness for you or for me to be proud. We did not create these gifts. We did not give these gifts. We do not explain these gifts. We simply have been assigned these gifts, and we've been assigned these gifts to serve each other. And not for our glory, but for Christ's glory, as we'll see more in our passage in just a moment. We need to always remember what Paul said to the Corinthian church, 1 Corinthians 4, 7, for who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it. Whatever gift the Lord has given us, it ought to be a reason for our humility, not our pride. As I said, we ought to always think about Jesus when we think about these gifts. Think about His ascension, His triumph as we think about these gifts. This, this is about God's grace. 
John Calvin said this. He said, The Lord hath so divided his manifold graces that no one is to be content with one thing and with his own gifts, but everyone has need of the help and aid of his brother. This, I say, is a bond which God hath appointed for retaining friendship among men, for they cannot live without mutual assistance. Thus it happens that he who in many things seeks the aid of his brethren ought to communicate to them more freely what he has received. This bond of unity has been observed and noticed by heathens. But Peter teaches us here that God had designedly done this, that he might bind men one to another. I mean, by, get, by distributing gifts the way the Lord has, what has he done? He has created a mutual dependence in this body between all of us. I need you, you need me. We need each other. The gifts do not all reside in any one of us. The Lord has distributed this, this variegated grace that we might all be bound together and in that way serve each other, need each other, and together serve Jesus. Something else I would point out, a fifth thing about these gifts, they can be divided into two categories. Peter's dealing with them generally. Those other lists we, we've looked at briefly tonight, 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, there you see the gifts sort of broken out in, in more detail, but here Peter means to deal with them generally. And notice how he describes them in verse 11. He says, whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. So as you consider the fact that you have a gift and And if you think about what has the Lord made me for, just realize you're going to find greater strength, generally speaking, in one of these areas or the other. Someone who's been gifted to speak, that is to preach or to teach or to instruct, whether it be in a public setting or a private, you know, more of a one-on-one kind of teaching or instruction, you may find that that's where your gift resides or you may find greater strength in your life in the area of of practical deeds of service. And there's, just look at the New Testament, there are many ex- examples of how we serve each other in material, practical ways. Even noting those two general categories, though, we need to be careful that we don't make these two categories exclusive of each other. Just because you may be gifted to teach or preach does not mean you are, are, are excluded from physical acts of service or just because you are meant to serve in more practical ways. It doesn't excuse you from speaking the Word of God and declaring the things that you know to be true. But generally speaking, we can divide the gifts into these two categories, speaking gifts, serving gifts. The sixth general thing I would point out about the reality of these gifts is is God is the one who makes them useful. God is the one who enables their operation. Because we are good stewards of God's grace. And His grace is not just known in the gift itself, but in the operation of the gift. There's an active sense to the grace of God. This is why you'll see the apostles praying for believers and and wishing for them the grace of God. These are people who are already saved. And yet grace to you, for example, they will write, God's grace has an active sense about it. In the realm of spiritual gifts, we we know the grace in the gift itself, but we know the grace in the operation of the gift. And that's why verse 11 says, whoever speaks, how do you speak? As one who speaks oracles of God. That is, you're mindful that you're speaking on behalf of God. You're mindful that you're speaking the words of God and the one who serves in verse 11, as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. We speak in His power, we serve in His strength, in His power. We need to always be reminded that if the Lord isn't working, nothing is getting done. If you ever just begin to, to lean on what you've come to experience in terms of the gift that God has given you, and you begin to lean more on your, quote, giftedness than on the God who gave the gift and is active and at work in and through the gift, you've missed the mark. 
You, you, you might learn to be a good speaker, but if the Lord's not dealing with hearts, it's empty. You might learn to be skillful in service, but if the Lord is not working, it'll just be the kind of service that anybody could give. What we're thinking about now is the fact that what we need is the sense of God's presence. What we need is the experience of God's power. What we need is the transformation, the, the life impact that only the Lord can do. And so if you ask, where are the gifts being fruitful in their, in their use? The answer is where people are depending upon the Lord and trusting in the Lord. And the Lord is at work through those gifts. So the reality of spiritual gifts, these, these things are real. The Lord has given them. They're expressions of His grace. Each one of us has received one. They are multifaceted, multicolored. They're given to us for service to other people. There, there are speaking gifts and serving gifts. And the Lord is the, wor- the, the one who's at work in these gifts to make them effective. Now, with that in mind, what kind of responsibility then do we have? What kind of responsibility? As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. Good stewards. What kind of stewardship is imparted by the fact that you have received a spiritual gift? Well, first of all, you're responsible to use it. Maybe that's right there's where we drop the ball. Maybe, maybe, maybe right there's where we go astray in our thinking. We don't take that seriously. He says in verse 10, use it to serve one another. It's as straightforward as that. It's as practical as that. You're to use your gift. Romans 12, 6 said the same thing. Having gifts that differ, according to the grace given to us, let us use them. Let us use them. We are meant to be active. I wonder why the Spirit of God would tell us to use our spiritual gift. Why does He have to tell us that? Because believers are tempted to sit on the sidelines when they ought to be actively engaged in ministry. We can be tempted to let other people do what we're supposed to be doing and rely on other people to do what we have a responsibility to do. If we're not careful, we can find ourselves spiritually lazy. And we know that, don't we? We, we, We've all experienced that when when it's like we lack spiritual zeal and desire and strength. One of the ways that we overcome that is we, we simply stop and, and realize, look, I've got a stewardship. The Lord has saved me and called me to ministry. He has gifted me for ministry. And I'm to be actively who I am in Christ and what He's making me in Christ. I'm to be actively engaged, involved in the lives of other people members of my spiritual family, for His glory, for their good, whatever form that takes. We can be tempted to live like people who only receive instead of people who are called to give. Can I ask you tonight, are you you sitting on the sidelines? Have you really let this kind of stewardship sink in? Maybe you've been been a mindful steward when it comes to your money. Maybe you've been a mindful steward when it comes to your time or a mindful steward when it comes to your family. Are you a mindful steward of your spiritual gift? Because you're told in this verse to use it. You have that stewardship. Also notice the very fact that he uses the word steward here, the word means to be a house manager. That is, you've been given someone else's things, and now you're called to to manage them in a way that the one who gave you this trust will be pleased. So you need to think about the the responsibility that's been imparted to you in this way. One day, I'm going to give an account to the Lord for what He enabled me to do in ministry. My spiritual gift, then, is a trust Jesus has given it to me. The Spirit of God has imparted it to me. 
It's, it's multifaceted. I'm fit by God's grace as long as I am walking with him, yielded to Jesus, a, a pure vessel. I, I, I can serve the Lord, and one day I'm going to give an account for what I've done with what he's given me. And not just the gift itself, but then the opportunities that were set in front of me, that either I walk through the door and I, I, I engage these things or I just let them pass me by. You think about yourself as a steward when it comes to ministry. And the other responsibility I would mention is you're responsible to, to remain humble, to realize your dependence on the Lord to be useful. Whoever speaks as one who speaks the oracles of God, you see, that requires humility. He's reminding the speakers to remember something. They need the words of God. You'll never have the right kind of faith in the sufficiency of Scripture without also understanding the insufficiency of your own wisdom, your own words. What, what do the people of God need? The Lord has gifted you, sent you to teach His Word. Now, what do they need? They need His Word. That's the right perspective. That's the, I mean, the humble perspective in every case is just the right perspective. It's just the realistic perspective. You want to know what humility is? It's just realism. You really know who God is. You really know who you are. You really know what people need. You really know what they don't need. So you strive in accordance with what's real. Every form of pride is also a form of deception. But this is just as true. And here's, here's I want to underscore this. Do you realize this is just as true with service? It's funny, isn't it? If you were to get up and speak tonight, you're going to be praying on the front row because you understand, Lord, I can't do this without you. But notice he says it's not just in speaking that we're to be mindful of our need for God. But he says, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. You can't serve well without the strength of the Lord. I wonder when you go out to just, to just carry out acts, deeds of service in the name of Jesus... Do you, in the midst of that service, do you, before you go, while you go, and after you go, realize, Lord, I need you to make this something more than just something the world could provide. I need you. If, if, if people are going to see Christ in this and be impacted by this, if I'm going to connect this with your name and their spiritual good, I need you. You have to make this powerful. I'm trusting you to to turn this into something that accomplishes a spiritual end. How do you do that? You do that by being mindful of it. You also do it, in both cases, speaking and serving through prayer. Prayerless acts are proud acts. And we'll know whether we're walking in humility or not and how much we sense our need for God and our dependence upon Him by how much we pray in connection with what it is we're doing in His name. So the reality of spiritual gifts, the responsibility that's imparted by them, I'm to use the gift God has given to me, and I'm to use it mindful of the fact that I'm a steward. I've been given a trust, and that means I use this depending upon the one who's entrusted me with this, knowing I'll have to give an account to Him. Lord, I need you if this is to be useful, fruitful, effective. This gives us the third and final thing tonight. Notice the reason for them. According to this text, why did the Lord give spiritual gifts? As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that. In everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To Him 
belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. You have a secondary reason identified in the verses. You have a primary reason. The secondary reason I'll mention first, when he tells us to serve one another, he makes clear that, that this is why the Lord gave gifts, that we might be, by God's grace, beneficial spiritually in each other's lives. We can say it this way. This is how the body of Christ is animated. The church is a living organism. Christ has ascended into the heavens, and now we represent Christ's presence here on earth. Christ is making himself known through his body, the church. And so the body is living and active and useful by means of spiritual power that's being expressed, the manifestation of the Spirit. It's how the gifts are described in 1 Corinthians 12. The Spirit's presence is being manifested as our gifts are being put to use under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. This is how the world comes in contact with the Lord Jesus, and this is how we experience Christ from each other's lives. It's as we, in trusting Jesus, serve each other with the gift that He has given us. But that is toward an ultimate end, the primary reason, and that is the glory of God. They've been given to benefit people, but they've been given for God's glory. In order that in everything God may be glorified. Glorified in what sense? Well, glorified in the sense of praised, worshipped, delighted in, admired, reverenced. I mean that God's name would be magnified. That His true nature, His true word, His true character would be put on display in this world. And notice that this is the goal, this is the ambition in everything. There, there is, there's nothing excluded if you want to talk about the smallest areas of service or the most public areas of service, the motivation, the aim is always to be the same. That God would be praised, that He would be loved, that He would be known, that He would be admired, that He would be exalted. And notice that all of this is through Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ, He says. That is, these things are to be lived out in a way that it reflects our union with Christ. It reflects our fellowship with Jesus. It reflects our dependence upon Jesus. It, 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 it is used by God to explain Christ, to proclaim Christ. God glorified through our relationship with His Son. And as all of this takes place, we need to acknowledge that all that we are experiencing in all of this is what belongs to God by His very nature. End of verse 11, to Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. And believers say, Amen. This praise of God, this authority and rule of God is what God is worthy of by His very nature. So when we serve, here and now, we serve in light of what God is truly worthy of and will be on display for the rest of eternity. We are expressing now what will belong to God forever and ever, which means that the right atmosphere and the right context and the right mindset for service in the church is an eternal one. It's an everlasting one. The everlasting worth of God is the goal and the motivation for everything we do in His name as we serve each other with the capacities that He has given to us and we've received through salvation. This is how the church is built up. This is how the church is edified. This is how the church matures. The teachers teach. And we all serve in light of what we learn, and in that way we, are, we, we grow into a mature man, not tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine, but we grow up in the likeness of Jesus. Christ is increasingly manifested in the life of a church 
that embraces these truths. So, when I say stewardship, don't neglect this. Don't forget that the Lord has not only saved you, He has gifted you for ministry and imparted to you as a result a stewardship. You are a house manager and you are going to give an account for what you do or don't do in His name. Don't sit on the sidelines. Begin to think about how you can actively be used by God to benefit your brethren and serve the Lord well. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for these truths and pray that we would take these things, Lord, into our hearts and minds and and really meditate upon them. I pray the result would be, Lord, a, a confession of sin where we have not been active, where we've not been engaging others, where we have been isolated Isolating ourselves as though we don't need anybody else and as though we're not responsible to invest in anyone else. That we would turn away from that kind of life and and in light of your great worth, the glory that is yours, we would spend and be spent on behalf of, of your children and in ministry to a lost and dying world. I pray the result of tonight, Lord, would be that we'd be encouraged, realizing that you are the one who's equipped us. You'll make us useful in different ways. We're we're not the same, Lord. You've made us all different, but in our own unique way. You'll use us for your namesake, and you'll use us for the good of others, and you'll use us to exalt Jesus, and that should encourage our hearts. And so, Lord, I pray we would leave here tonight committed to being good stewards of your many-colored grace. And in that way, this body will be built up and become more like your Son. We ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together.